Thank you for your input. One thing I would I would like to clear up, I, and I'm not sure I've been here a while. I don't think that it is required for the checkpoints to come to the delegation yeah. for yeah, approval. It's a it's a, right. it's a commissioner uh, issue that 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 would happen. It is not a vote of the delegation to to do that. And I think that through the highway grant, through the federal money and whatnot, that's really how it goes. So. And I, I do have to say, Representative uh, Treganza um, did want to be able to bring this up. It's the first time that we've done, but thank you, Sheriff, for bringing, for bringing in the chief for all of it. You were here, and there's my chief back there. Chief Dawson, good to see you, sir. <laughs> Stay on good, good grounds with your local yeah. police. <laughs> so, uh, Representative Treganza, if you want to um, ask a question, then we'll open up to the rest of the delegation members um, and see where we go from there. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. <coughs> Each of us who are elected and those of us who serve in public service have taken an oath to uphold the Constitution. And Article, uh, excuse me, Amendment Number 4 uh, reads, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. The checkpoints are not consistent with the Fourth Amendment. Representative Treganza. Yes. I would like you to say that in your opinion, you do not feel that the checkpoints are in Oh, okay, in your fair opinion, enough. Yes, I think that we in, need to be sure that you're making a stance for yourself and not for the rest of everybody. Okay. Okay. Well, as <clears throat> then as, as I read the Fourth Amendment, the checkpoints are not consistent uh, with the Fourth Amendment. Okay. Could I answer that? Yes. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I... Um, I'll, I'll be so bold as to say, um, I think I'm probably the most constitutional strict person in the world. Okay. Let me tell you why I think they are. Um, a couple of uh, couple of things. First of all, let me start with the first. We did take an oath. All law enforcement officers take an oath to uphold the Constitution. That's what we work for. That's why we're here. We're here to protect the Constitution and people's rights, which are God-given. Okay. Um, basically, the Constitution is the foundation of all our laws. It gives the, it gives the state, and if you believe in the Tenth Amendment, then you believe that the state has the right to make its own laws. And if you believe in the People's House, which is the legislature, you believe that the people have the right to make laws that they feel are good for their state. In this case, the people spoke and they made a law which is the ultimate court it's the people's house they made a law saying we think we need checkpoints all laws are vetted out to see whether they're constitutional or whether they're not before they even go into effect so this issue is not a new issue it was, it's been looked at but um, first of all there's a misnomer here that we're doing unreasonable searches and let me let me address that because that's that's going down a wrong turn First of all, we're not doing the search. We're not searching anybody. We don't pull over people and search cars. We do a vehicle stop, which does not take probable cause. It takes reasonable and articulable suspicion to stop a vehicle. We stop a vehicle within strict guidelines for a specific purpose. And that purpose is under three minutes to see whether a person might be drinking to see whether a person might kill somebody. We have a specific agenda, a specific timeline, and a specific procedure. Not only do we not need probable cause to stop somebody, because we're not doing a search, we're mo doing a momentary detention. And that, that is, a momentary detention it is well-founded in law that it's a stop based on reasonable articulable suspicion. But in New Hampshire, we're the most strict state with EWI checkpoints. We go above and beyond all requirements that the Constitution would dictate. 
we put together what would be akin to a search warrant, even though it's not a search. And the application process goes through the superior court. So the question is, are we going out willy-nilly and just putting up checkpoints anywhere, anytime we want? No, we're not. We're asking the court for permission. We're telling them what we're doing. We're telling them why we're doing it, what the purpose is, and how we're going to do it. And then we do, we tell them the mechanism for pulling the cars over, how long we're going to keep the person stopped. And what happens there when you find something suspicious? What are our rights then? Where do we go from there? And we don't act on anything that is not suspicious once we, you know, once we make the stop. And people go. We do a survey of these stops. We give out 100 because the numbers are easier to do. Numbers. So we give out 100, you know, whether we're going to stop 200 or 300, we give 100 out. I get 98% of the people are very positive to the stop. They thought the stop was not intrusive. They thought the stop was for a good reason. And they give positive feedback. I have about 2% that say they don't like the stop. One of the people uh, in the last two years that we've been doing it, one of the people said, you shouldn't advertise these things. These are good. You shouldn't advertise them. You shouldn't tell people you're going to be having a checkpoint. So that was one complaint. I kind of see that as a positive, not a complaint. The, the other people said I shouldn't be stopped. Well, three people out of 200, 200 people, I don't see as overwhelming a public outcry. Um, by and large, checkpoints are, are one piece of a, an overall puzzle. It's our opportunity to, to work with the, the other things that we do, which are the DOI patrols, uh, the other enforcement that we do, the educational board, and to have one, you know, in, in Wakefield, it's one night a year. And we look and say, we put the dipstick in, how are we doing? Let's see what's going on out there. What are the results? Is it of itself a DWI program all alone? No, it's part of a, a global thing. But the Constitution also says that searches and, and again, this is not a search, that they'll be reasonable. There's nothing about this that's unreasonable. We've gotten permission, we advertise it, and we do it in less than three minutes. That's not unreasonable to keep the roads safe. Now, if you live in a free society, the idea is that Will there be some limitations on some freedoms? Yes, there will be. But are they reasonable limitations? You know, for example, should we be able to walk into a plane <coughs> without anybody looking at us? Or is checking us reasonable? Or do we go too far with that? These are all good discussion points, and they're all issues <coughs> that we all as citizens have a responsibility to examine. And you folks do have a responsibility to examine what we're doing here, and you should. But I would contend that this is reasonable, and basically that the stops for the four-hour detail, they go quick. And basically, if you're not doing anything wrong, you're on your way before you even know you were stopped. Um, now, uh, this is a two-part dog and pony show. So I've talked to people, um, and I'd like to, for this, this is some very good information that um, you add to it. <coughs> There's one more question when that Representative Knox. Just a quick question before you move on to someone else. Uh, this is not a, uh, questioning the uh, legality of a sobriety checkpoint is not new, I believe. Uh, uh, this must have been challenged in the courts, uh, and so can, can you just in a word or two, explain whether they have backed this up or not in terms of what you're doing. Yes, the courts have over and over have looked at this issue. It's been vetted out, and basically it's very legal. Uh, but I defer a little bit of that to okay. uh, my partner. <coughs> Just a couple of cases. Michigan v. Sits is the federal case. Okay, and your name, sir? Oh, Chief Mulholland, Sean Mulholland. Thank you. 
Allenstown Police Department. Michigan uh, v. Sitz is the federal case that authorizes spread checkpoints and said they are legal. Uh, and the state case is State v. Cobble, back in the uh, 80s, actually. <clears throat> the Concord checkpoint case where they conducted a checkpoint without <clears throat> any standards or regulations or procedures. And that was considered unconstitutional mm -hmm. because they didn't do it properly. After that, someone in the legislature submitted the bill. <clears throat> they had it sent to the Supreme Court to get an opinion of the justices. The opinion of the justices, they put a whole set of regulations that should be used for checkpoints. That bill never became law. However, we in law enforcement, without any regulations at all, developed our own standards that actually exceed that bill. And that's what you see today. New Hampshire has the most restrictive sobriety checkpoint procedures anywhere in the country. In the state of Vermont, two police officers can get together and say, let's run a checkpoint right now, anytime, any place. That's all they have to do. Massachusetts is the same way, and so is Florida and a number of other states. We don't allow that here. You can't do that. You have to justify the reason why you're doing the checkpoint, why the other methods are not effective, and why it's more appropriate to do the checkpoint. And you have to have a standard by which you do that. We have to have logs and all kinds of paperwork that other states don't have to do. New Jersey comes the closest to us, but not even close. On the procedures that we have to follow. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Just a question for my own information. Uh, during the course of one of your four hour periods where you stop people, uh, what, how many people do you normally catch during that period? Is that doing um, something that should, what's your? We, uh, you know, because everything, I mean, this is a world of paperwork now, as you know, but we have to report back to, we have to report back our results. Um, Last year's checkpoint. Well, he's looking for that. For instance, in Allenstown, we average anywhere from 8 to 12 arrests um, for a variety of different offenses. Out of how many? Out of how many cars that have stopped? About three to 400. Do you, do you get anybody for other violations? Yes, there are other people that walk in, and they come into the checkpoint, they don't have a license on them, they have marijuana sitting out in plain view or cocaine. Um, those a variety of different offenses that there are out there. But most of them are DUIs, but there are other offenses that people do get charged with that are in plain view. Okay. Let me let me tell you what, what we do on our checkpoint. When we stop a car, we're not fishing for a bunch of minor violations. So we won't do taillights, we won't do an on inspection, we won't do things like that. We're not there for that. We're there for the a cause. So when we did last year's, we did we had two hundred and eighty-four stops. Uh, out of the 284 of the stops, 15 of those were actually asked to step out of the car and done field sobriety check tests and things like that. Um, we had um, we also run what what we call as chase cars. We have cars on either end of the checkpoint that that watch people who are going different directions and watch their watch how they operate and see whether they should pull them over based on. If they violate a law while well, they're out there, like cross the line or things like that, they'll be pulled over. But, for example, if somebody pulls a U-turn and goes the other way, an officer, if he's in the area, will follow them. If they cross the line or they're weaving or they're going too slow, they'll pull them over. That's probably why they turned around in the first place. Um, so we had 25 stops of those types. Um, so we picked up, there were, checkpoint arrests were five arrests. Um, Three were drug related, uh, drugs and alcohol are not uncommon to each other. Uh, and two, one DWI arrest, uh, there was one operating after, um, and transportation of alcohol, a couple of those, and so that's, that's what we get. Oh, we also, what we get at the stop is only half of the equation, it's two sides of the coin. When we do this publicly, like people will probably hear about this today, uh, when we do this publicly, we're telling people we're going to have a checkpoint. We're going to have a checkpoint, guess what, in August. And guess what's probably going to be on a weekend night. That slows people down on the weekends because the mere fact that they know we're having it, they might say, I may not drink in August on a weeknight in Wakefield. So therefore, the numbers that we get are actually skewed down, obviously. If we didn't advertise this and we didn't come up here and we just did it blindly, you could probably double those numbers. But the fact is, is we're keeping people off the road, even if we never got an arrest, we're keeping people off the road telling people that we're gonna have a checkpoint. And our ultimate goal is not how many arrests we get. 
our ultimate goal is how many people don't die. 